Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to a very interestingly, differently themed que monthly question and answer session. Usually we talk about everything and anything genealogy related, but we're taking a very different slant here. We're going to talk about all the things related to the 1921 census and possibly veering into uh, other things in the 1920s, other records that might be able to help you as well. So we're all very, very excited. And I've brought along some wonderful friends. Uh, they can't fly on the same plane together. It's like royalty. If the, the plane goes down, then all of genealogy will never recover. So we've got them in one room, technically, virtually. Um, but uh, here they are. I've got Jen Baldwin and Paul Nixon from Find My Past, that wonderful, wonderful company that we all uh, love so much. And if you have any questions, there have been some submitted early, but don't uh, let that be a limit. Ask a question now. Ask all the way through the hour. If something has sparked your interest, put that in the comments as well and ask too, and we'll be answering questions all the way through the hour. So straight away, we have a couple of early questions we just want to ask. Uh, first of all, uh, there's been a question about transcriptions. So if you have an image, if you get hold of an image on the 1921 census, a lot of people have run straight to the image because they want to see that original handwriting, all the exciting stuff, and they spot a transcription error, perhaps when they found it or when they're looking at different little parts of it. How would they be able to correct that transcription without having to buy the transcript and report an error on that transcription page? Jen, do you have an answer for that? Yeah, you didn't actually say it was going to answer this. I was waiting. Uh, yeah, so it is possible to report a transcription error directly from an image. Um, this is something that um, we're going to ask you to do via email, actually. So um, we've created a new email account for this. It's transcript support at findmypast.com. Um, so if you find a transcription error on, on an image versus a transcription page, um, we would ask you to submit it by email. Now, if you have purchased a transcription, there is a button in the system already on the website. Just click that button, report an error, uh, and, and follow that process. It all goes to the same place, um, should all be updated. And we will be doing updates on transcriptions regularly over the next, probably th consistently for sure, over the next three months. Um, so just continue to watch um, those those. Um, uh, reports do get acted on as quickly as we can. Um, and imagine, you know, you can all imagine with a collection of this size, there are transcription errors coming in. Um, so we will act on those as efficiently as possible. Um, but we do ask for your patience because it's a very large collection. That's pretty fair. That's all right. So if you do spot anything, definitely get that in. I've seen some changes already. At some things that I went to look for are now uh, improved and different. So it's definitely something that's happening as we speak. And it's really, really moving things forward. Uh, there's a question that has come up in a few different forms, which I think is worth addressing. Uh, Paul, you might be best placed for this one. Uh, it costs a little bit of extra money to look at the 1921 <clears throat> census. Why is that then? Yeah, hello. Uh, hi, Mika. Hello, Jen. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, it does cost extra money and it costs us a small fortune. Um, the National Archives couldn't uh, do this on their own. They sought a commercial partner uh, to publish the census. Uh, we were lucky enough to win it. Not lucky. It was a hard effort and a lot of slog and, and a lot of experience. But yeah, we knew it would cost us uh, money. We knew it was a financial risk uh, for the company. Um, but nevertheless, we still put the money where our mouth was and, and we have to make the money back and w there's no way that we would make the money back if it went into a sub and so that's why we've um that's one of the reasons why we've made it pay-per-view also were we to put were, were we to have put it into a sub it would restrict access to those people who had a sub only um but by making it pay-per-view you have the option uh, everybody has the option to look at it and there's a discount if uh, for 12 month uh, subscribers uh, who, who want to purchase a, a transcription or an image, uh, there's a 10% discount. Um, and it's not necessary necessarily always to um, purchase the transcription. You can get a lot of information just by looking at the image. Um, you can hover over the transcription button as well and see other members of the household. Um, so that's that's the reason we, we we're we need to make the money back uh we need to make it accessible to everybody i, I was trying to explain this uh to some people the other day and and really i mean i've, I've 
subscribe to Amazon. I've got Amazon Prime. And you get all the films, uh, of course, as a member of Amazon Prime. You get the documentaries. You get this, that, and the other. But, you know, they there's premium product as well. So if you want to see a boxing match or something, you, you have to pay extra. And it's that type of approach. That's that's how I think of it. Does that answer the question, Miko, do you think? I think so. I think that's fair. I, I think, um, yeah, it, it's it's a big thing. And this is one of those uh, questions that I mean, this happened with 1911 census and, and the 1939 register and things. And this just is, I guess, the fairest way of doing things for those people, which is, as we were speaking a, a point earlier, Jen and I and, and, and things about those people who don't have any English ancestors that, you know, would would probably be frustrated if they had to pay for it and they wouldn't use it. So, you know, this is a the fairest way i guess and it's it's such a massive investment such a big thing hundreds of people working on and stuff that took so long and i'm I'm mostly impressed at how even during covid and everything else that we've still managed to get things through and get things done and it's it's interesting when you take a look at maybe twitter or something like that the the, uh, the happy stories of some of the things that are being found that make this i think when we think about it, it costs seven pounds for a uh, pdf version of a birth or death certificate it costs uh you know 11 pounds if you want it printed there are other things that are really really you know comparative and, and this actually steps up you know, fairly fairly well up after that uh, so uh, yeah really really interesting and yeah, i think it's worth pointing out as well miko isn't it that, it, that it's cheaper than 1939 we we, we, list, we listen to people yeah. after we published 1939 it's cheaper than 1911 um so you know I, and and honestly speaking you'd say well he does say that he would say that because he works at five my past but i do think it's the best release we've done i think it's the, the detail there, the the number of fields we've transcribed, um, yeah. there's 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 a hundred separate fields altogether. If you added wow. all the different fields up that we've transcribed, um, it's a complete transcription of everything that you'll see on the census, and that doesn't come without considerable effort and cost. Wow, yeah, no, that's something that's it's easy to forget when you see just your ancestors' entry. Yeah, how many fields have been transcribed, so you can search on all of that. So that's a big thing to point out. Um, a question that I think is destined for Jen. Um, is is there a 1921 census in the United States, and if not, why? There is not a 1921 census in the United States. There's a 1920 census in the United States instead, um, and that has actually been available in the public domain for quite some time. It's on every major genealogical website, including Find My Past. Um, so in the U.S., we do the censuses on the zero years, and in the U.K., they do them on the on the ones. Um, so same same format. Every ten years, there's a census. Um, the biggest difference probably is that the privacy restriction in the United States is 72 years versus the hundred years that we um, see under the 1920 Census Act in in England. So. Um, yeah, so yeah, absolutely available. 1920 census. There's also a 1921 census in Canada. Um, so you get really the th kind of the three of the major English speaking um, countries all within a few months of each other. Fantastic. That's uh, great to hear. And uh, they're every 10 years as well, are they? Canada, yes, they are. Yeah. Okay. And a question here came up um, Could the search results show the first names of other household members so that you know you're buying the correct image? Paul, do you know about that one? Yeah, I do, because I, I just saw Brian's comment come in and I thought I'd highlight it. Um, so I've done this, uh, actually, Brian. It, it's, I'm going to use my family as an example. So the Nixons uh, were living in Hackney in Stoke Newington uh, in 1921. Um, and if you hover over the transcription, you can... Uh, I look for my grandfather, Walter, Walter Leonard Nixon. Um, so I hover over his name and it says that uh, also in the household are John and Elizabeth Julia, um, doesn't give the surname, just John and Elizabeth Julia. But I know that John is his father, my great great grandfather, and and Julia Elizabeth is his wife. Um, so I then did a search um, for Julia Elizabeth Nixon living in the same location, same parish, um, Stoke Newington, Hackney, and the result. And then hovered over the result that appeared for her, and it gave uh, two other members of the household living there as well, which was her husband again. Um, and Mabel, Emma, another sister. So it is possible uh, in a slightly convoluted way to reveal other family members as well. Fantastic. Sounds really, really useful. And uh, it's good always to make sure you've got the right person um, rather than, you know, getting the wrong one a few times. So that's quite a big thing. A uh, good question from Rosie. Uh, I'm aware that a small percentage of the 1921 census entries were lost to water damage. Is it known if that affected a specific area of the country? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, so I actually um, got an answer to this question, Rosie, while um, Paul was addressing some of the other issues. So we do know that um, Lanx, Yorks, Durham, and parts of South Wells were affected uh, by that water damage, not in their entirety, uh, just small samples of those particular locations. Um, and I'm going to respond in the chat with some particularly affected uh, districts. Um, uh, so you have that information. But again, this is not uh, water damage that covers the entirety of those regions, but we do know that those parts of the country were affected by that damage. Fantastic. That's a good one. And did you see um, that I use links? Look at me did. go. Very good. No, it's yeah. good. It, 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 we've seen over years the, the slow, I would say, um, Englishification, Anglicization of Jen. And I imagine very soon she'll have a bowler hat and she'll be sitting with I a cup not. of tea, lifting her little <laughs> finger going through. I think nope. we're going to watch this uh, descent. Uh, I would say descent. It's definitely not ascent. I'm just returning to my roots, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, a good question here uh, from Brian about the military, which I think, Paul, would be really good, well-placed. Do 1921 army records include children living at army barracks? I can only find husband and wife on separate pages, but child and baby are nowhere in the 1921 census. Any thoughts, Paul? Well, great question. Um, I've not explored the army in great detail so far in 1921. You would imagine they would be in the barracks. Um, it would be similar to um, to the 1911 census, I, I would imagine, but Brian might know more about it than I do for that matter. Um, I'd expect to see the soldiers enumerated on one return and wives and children on, on the other, as with 1911. But, um, but, but I don't know uh, I don't know that for sure because I've not I've not found it and not neither have I looked for it. Um, but I can't imagine where where else the children would be, uh, Brian, in that case. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't come up with an answer. I would have thought they would be in barracks in the married quarters um, would be my honest opinion. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's we know that there are soldiers serving overseas in many different uh, records in the 1901 census. And so, you know, some really interesting ones, but it's a good point about civilians who are with those soldiers and everything. Um, there's a, a good comment uh, here uh, from Claire, which I think probably echoes a lot of different things for different reasons that might be helpful. Um, Jen, Claire is uh, asking to contact someone about her subscription. Uh, she's got a sort of more specific problem. Um, and uh, I don't know, is there a, a, a good email to send her to for any of these sort of problems with your subscription or anything like that that uh, you need some, someone to look at specifically? Absolutely, Claire. Please just send us an email at support at findmypast.com. Uh, so support at findmypast.com. Uh, I don't think we have a banner for that to put on the screen. Um, but that will be handled through our customer support team who are located in Dundee. Um, and they are quite busy right now. Um, so we're just asking for a bit of patience um, as we get all uh, work through all those emails and communications. So please bear with us as we work through that. They are working essentially around the clock um, to answer all these emails. Brilliant. Uh, another question from Suze here. Is this census the same as other ones like the layout? Paul, shall, I, shall I take that one? Sure, yeah, Paul, I, 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 I put that one up there. Um, it's different. Um, you know, for the first time, a 1911 census gave you some great information, which which hadn't been on previous census returns. So you had uh, the year of years of marriage, uh, the number of children who had been born, the numbers that were still living. Uh, you had an infirmity column as well. Um, so that was all fantastic information, which hadn't appeared on previous census returns. On 1921, uh, that information sadly doesn't appear. It's a shame. It's only just on that one particular return. But you do get um, other fields on 1921. You get the um, uh, the employer field, uh, you get the employer address, um, and you get the uh, a column for, uh, for orphanhood. So you can, of course, you see number of children who lost their, their fathers uh, or in the First World War um, or, or at other times. So you do get other information. So it's different. Um, each census is, is different. There's something different about about each one. You really need to investigate it yourself, Suze. Um, have, a, have a look, do, do some free searches on the 1921 census, and then um, uh, hopefully find find somebody close to you and uh, open the document up, have a look at the image or have a look at the transcription. But you'll find it's different from other census returns. Yeah, fantastic. It's, I, I, I kind of lament the uh, uh, number of children born, number of children still living, and number of years married that's missing from the 1921 census. That would have been incredibly useful to have. But I guess we've got workplace and uh, you know who you work for as well, which is... And divorce. Don't so forget about divorce. 
divorce as well. The first sentence is to add divorce. That's a really good one. Um, I, another one, Paul Sue, uh, says, I have my granddad's army number, but I can't find him when I put that in. So do I just need to apply for his records, whatever regiment they were, uh, which was Leicestershire Regiment? Well, the thing is, uh, and again, uh, I've not been through it, obviously, in, in such great detail, but I would imagine that some some regiments um, would have recorded numbers. If, if it's anything like the, um, the 1911 census, regiments did, re uh, some of the returns do record the army, uh, the regimental number in those days. Uh, it would not be common, not be usual to see the army number written down. So don't, so that's not, un I wouldn't be surprised at that, the fact that you haven't found him. Um, but the MOD... Uh, would probably have his record still at this point in time. So uh, you could write to the MOD. If you if you search online, go to Google and just uh, type in Veterans UK, you'll come to the MOD website. And then you can, uh, there's a section there that says service records. Just click on that link and you'll find what you need to do to uh, obtain a service record. But be aware uh, and be warned that you won't get everything. They'll just send you what they think you should see. So they'll, and, and it'll be photocopies. There'll be, I remember sitting with you, Miko, actually, at Family yeah, History Yeah, I was about to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, was, we were looking at you, looking in dismay at what you'd received. It was nothing but black <laughs> lines and bars, and it's like the, where he was born, where he lived. And then just yeah. that was it. The rest was all blacked out, which was really frustrating because I knew that bit already. But it was nice to have a new document. Yeah, but it was, but, but yes, I mean, be, be aware that there's a cost. Um, uh, and it's, I think, thirty pounds is what you pay. Uh, you have to f fill in details about the soldier, fill in details about yourself, and then they will send you photocopies. It's not digital; it's photocopies, um, as Miko says, with bits redacted. And there we go. Okay, I've got a, a, quite a detailed one from Nicole, which is covering up Paul's face. So I'll, we'll read it aloud and we'll get rid of it. Because otherwise, you can't see us. There we go. There there. You go. Um, <laughs> Nicole has tried to search for a great great grandfather named William Rayhorn in the 1921 records. <laughs> Uh, he has a general idea where he might have been, thanks to a book of an interview by his son. But when trying to find him, can't get anything he knows. Uh, she knows he was with the traveling showman, but was told he was boarding somewhere while he worked. She's used variants on the last name, still can't find him. Any tips? She's found his wife, uh, her great great grandmother, but still can't find him. Jen, any ideas? You know, I, so I saw this comment come across um, and uh, I actually answered a similar one yesterday for a colleague who has a circus performer in his family tree. Uh, and we worked together to kind of help him find his person in 1921. So this is a great question. Um, and I think it goes back to all of those fields that we transcribed and indexed um, for this particular collection. There are thousands of different configurations you can use to search the census. So I would search with something a little bit less complicated. Um, ignore his surname for a minute, um, put in his first name, where you think he might be located, and then use a variety of optional keywords. It's the second to last search box in the advanced search page. Um, go all the way down to the bottom of the search screen, you'll see optional keywords and start putting in things like showman, traveler, um, look at the institution list that's available on the Find My Past website in the additional materials section of the search page and see if you can identify the institutions, the hotels uh, where he might have been staying in that area and search those particular um, fields by first name. Uh, not not by surname, especially with a surname that can be um, spelled and, and, and used in so many different varieties. So play around with those search combinations um, and with the information you have to narrow down the results. That would be my, my number one tactic. Yes. And as we said at the start, that although we're focusing a lot on the ICT on census, because this is a really big release and it's something that a lot of people are, are you know hopefully using to break down all kinds of brick walls there's plenty of other early 20th century records that are of great use and great help and i think this question from lucy um is uh, something that i think you might be able to help with paul it's a, a military records of the 20th century i think might be useful here she's trying to find the relative who perished on the 27th of december 1945 in the 5005 airfield construct uh, construction squadron raf his name is leslie hayes he's on a memorial in singapore she can't find his date of birth or a birth record for him or a death registration to get a death certificate she can't find any other raf documents for him and she's not sure if he's going to be on the 1921 census as a child and maybe he was born afterwards where would she look to find out more about leslie and maybe his life or his service or anything like that at this kind of point in time let me oh. unmute uh yeah no i'm here i i was just uh cogitating um studying that yeah um I, well there's two there's a number of different places i suppose i mean the the mod again would be 
the place because they would have his uh, service record. So again, go to the Veterans UK uh, website and um, think about applying for his record because that that should have all the information you're seeking. Um, there's, uh, have you checked Fire My Past's um, World War II, Emin died. Emin, Emin died in the Second World War because that might have additional information on there. Uh, it's something we license from the Naval and Military Press. Uh, so you'd find it on the Naval and Military Archive website as well, I believe, uh, or, or you could buy it from the Naval and Military Press uh, on CDs, but you don't need to because we have it on Fire My Past as a complete database. So, so have a look there. Uh, there should be a GRO death record for him as well. Um, Shouldn't they, Miko? Uh, we don't know, as you say, whether he's uh, whether he would have been born in 1921. If he died in 1945, uh, born in 1921, 24 years old, could have been born later than that. So it may not necessarily be on the 1921 census. Um, no, Miko, can you think of any other sources, electoral if, registers, possibly? I mean, I, I would have said if, if you've got a name like that, it, it, there's maybe two or three, five or six people with that name born in, in the range, right sort of age range to be serving in the RAF in World War II, and then you'd probably have to work on all of those and try and use, say, the 1921 census, and perhaps the people who you know are related to him and who might be in the same household, uh, and to find out, as we mentioned earlier, you can you know look at other people in the household without getting hold of a, an image or a census record to make sure you've got the right ones and maybe use that to narrow things down and see if he's around, if he's born later. Uh, and if you think that none of them are, are that Leslie in the household, then maybe you know, one of the later ones might be your birth. But uh, that would be my, my thoughts of getting there. But if, like you say, if there's some military records as well and maybe some other things, then that would be helpful. And Probably, see, yeah. yeah. Yeah, William has made a helpful comment here. There's a list of uh, Singapore uh, newspapers that are available that might mention the family as well that are worth looking at. Um, so perhaps take a look at that as well, that link that William shared in the comments too. So one of those detailed ones, I think, that will uh, will really go into uh, lots and lots of other records and delving around. And it's I think it's a common question of, you know, how do I separate when I have multiple people with the same name? That's something that we've all hit with so much. Uh, question from Audrey. Um, I haven't done a proper comparison yet, but I've looked at a lot of schedules. There seem to be more crossings out, horrible writing and general mess than in 1911. I suspect this was because there was less space to write more information. The place of birth and nationality columns are particularly narrow. I don't think that's a question, more of just an observation. I think that we we all have come across. <laughs> yeah, we, and we've certainly seen that observation from others as well. Um, there was a similar comment about the the given names field being smaller physically than in 1911 and so um so, you know one customer was seeing less middle names spelled out and more middle initials um although our own analysis has kind of gone gone back and forth on that so yeah it's important point to note though i i, I um I, I published that comment just now audrey without even realizing it was you <laughs> so uh, so lucky you audrey uh, I, I picked on you um but i think it, it's definitely it's definitely worth highlighting and, it, and we've noticed it on the on the returns that we've been transcribing um, the people where they've been filling information have not necessarily put it in the boxes you'd expect to find it and that presents problems for us when it comes to transcribing and it requires a lot of cleanup um, I mean if, and even even if you look at the the front of the 1921 census and look at the instructions look at the small print I mean people talk about the small print read the small print that is small print that's tiny print you know there's there's a lot of instruction there um, my my Nixon family, going back to them, uh, the census return was filled in not by the head of the household, but by uh, my grandfather's younger brother, Alf, uh, who was 24 at the time. His handwriting is beautiful and he's filled it all in so nicely. But then if you look at my maternal side, who were less well educated, um, it's all over the place. Bad spellings, different wrong boxes, bits crossed out. And it we should remember that it wasn't necessarily a simple document that it might not have been easily understood by everybody who was being asked to fill it in uh, and, and that therefore errors were made by them at the time and, and rectified tried to be rectified at the time but then we have to as uh, genealogists and historians try and make sense of it record it all properly and present it properly in a way that can easily be understood by our customers um, and, and that's something that was always going to take time and is still taking time and, and isn't perfect yet. So so just just um, bear that in mind. I just piggyback on that a little bit, Paul. Um, 
because the the example you raise is perfect, actually, for giving us another clue to our family's lives, right? Um, if the handwriting is nice and neat and tidy and they followed the instructions to the letter, it gives you an indication, at least, that you can make a theory around that they had the time to actually sit with the census return and do it properly. If it's messy and um, scribbled on and not quite right when you get that image, that should tell you something about kind of their day-to-day -day life and, and their abilities to actually make time for something like a census instead of chasing babies or, um, you know, trying to handle two or three jobs or, you know, struggling through the housing crisis or whatever their situation may be, right? It's, it's, it's an indicator to us as researchers as to what their day-to-day -day life and what their experience was in that moment. Yeah, absolutely. My, my my grandfather, the, my maternal grandfather, was was illiterate. He he was sixty five, working as a labourer in uh, the Woolwich Arsenal in nineteen twenty one. He'd had, um, I think, fifteen children by that stage. Wow. With with two, I know. Wow. Well, yeah. the, the oldest the oldest one was born in eighteen eighty. The youngest one was born in nineteen seventeen. So thirty seven years goodness. between the oldest and the youngest. Um, and my grandmother was um, she was born in 1911. She was the second or third youngest of, of those children. But um, they were a poor family. She um, she took it in turns to go to school um, with her with her sister. They they had one pair of shoes between them. One day she wore the shoes. The next day the, the sister wore the shoes. And, and it's very evident from that census return that um, that the level of literacy wasn't high. I look yeah. forward to the book on that family, Paul. That'd be an interesting <laughs> read. I just want to finish one the limit of the year. <laughs> I like how we see in, in the 1921 census that it, because this is someone filling things in themselves, not only said how people understand the rules and what they do, but you get uh, maybe a, a window into their priorities and what they're thinking. There was only a record today I was looking at for our, our wonderful 1921 census tour that hopefully all of you will be in attendance at some event around the world. But uh, the uh, future bailiff of Jersey, Alexander Coutanche, is in a household living with a gardener and his wife. And the gardener and the wife of the head and the, uh, you know, the wife of the head of the household. But they listed this young barrister above them in the household, even though the head is listed below and the border is listed above. So I don't know if that the gardener is saying, oh, you know, some idea of status or something. I don't know if they're making a point or if it's accidental, but there's something interesting when you see these strange little quirks that they're not how things are instructed to be put in, but maybe it gives you some idea into the thought process of, of what might have happened. And, and they, they appear more often than not. So they're really, really interesting to see. I forgot here. Um, Adele has made a point here. Not happy that you're the only place we can see the census. Um, Paul? Not quite true, actually, Dell. Is it? It's um, you, you can only see it on you can see it on Find My Past, but if you, but you can go to the National Archives. It's it's there free of charge. Uh, it's at the National Library of Wales free of charge at Aberystwyth, and it's at uh, Manchester Central Library as well free of charge. But um, but you will only see it on uh, on Find My Past online. That's a good one, and I've seen a few comments about a certain uh, certain phrase that uh, you're saying that Miko hasn't used this joke yet, but just you wait because it's coming. So I've already had that one in my repertoire, and uh, I was planning on ending with it, but don't you worry, it'll come when you least expect it. So all of those questions about when it's coming, who knows? Um, uh, you'll be as excited as the launch of the 1921 census, I'm sure, when it, when it's used. Um, but uh, Yes, a, a good question here. Um, well, a follow-up, Lucy has said. Um, thanks for answering the question. They're definitely going to look for the details about uh, Leslie Hayes. Um, he doesn't seem to exist until he died, and he had his Singapore Commonwealth War Graves record in 1945. Uh, she found his siblings, which is why I think he must be younger than 1921. His sister was born in 1923. Mm -hmm. Can't seem to see the link from the Singapore newspapers. And so I, I think that was a, a guy called William Shaw posted that. So if you want to scroll back in the comments, Lucy, it might be easier when... Um, we've stopped talking because I think it will get fired up the page as all of you are talking to each other and talking. So come back uh, when things have stopped and just take a scroll through and find that. That'll be a good one. If you've got the siblings and things like that, look for the siblings and try and find that family. And then you've got the household and that might really help you. Um, he might be in that family and that might be the easiest way to find. But it sounds like you're onto a winner and getting started. So that's a good one. What have you got here? Um, yes, William saying it's the button at the bottom. If you uh, hover over the video, you can see uh, closed captions uh, when someone's asking about turning the subtitles off. So um, I'm not sure how they will have butchered our three very different accents. And I'm sure uh, there are all <laughs> kinds of different things that might be going on. So uh, yes, that's one. A good question from uh, Philip McGavin. Uh, Jen, do, do, do we have any examples of the census that were completed by children? 
you know, I haven't seen any personally, but um, I think Ellie commented one that um, she found one in the 1911 census. I don't know if either of you have seen any that were completed wow. by children. Yeah, I'm sure there is one out there, but um, I haven't personally found it yet. They're yeah. all completed by children, Jen. Every <laughs> child of someone, aren't they? Every, every single okay, one. fair point, fair point. <laughs> So, uh, yes, it's a, I mean, it's supposed to be the head of the household that fills things in or the enumerator of the head of the household can't, but, uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've not seen one either, but it will be exciting. If you do find something really cool like that, um, then definitely we should let us know. And, uh, uh I think, yeah, that will be exciting to see. We've seen all kinds of dogs, cats and everything else, but uh, I haven't seen that yet. I think Miko, um, on a serious note, um, there were plenty of men who were blinded in the first world war, uh, who appear in the 1921 census. Uh, undergoing or doing different trades, you know, working, working as uh, basket weavers or masseurs or tobacconists. Um, and many of those men, the returns would have been filled in, of course, by other other household members. Um, almost certainly that some, some of those household members uh, would have been children and, and would have completed the census entry on, on behalf of their blinded father. Mm, that's a good point. It is, uh, and, and this is a point where literacy was. I, I think people were going to school then, but um, they weren't the level of education that they would receive now. So you will see a number of spelling mistakes, and handwriting can sometimes leave a lot to be desired. But uh, yeah, they're definitely, if there's someone in the household, children particularly will be more educated than perhaps some elder members of the family who hadn't had that schooling yet because it only came in in the early 1870s. But there are some good school records that cover this kind of period and people that be in the 1921 census as well, aren't there? Some brilliant school records. I know Paul wants to talk about it, though. <laughs> I <laughs> no, well, it yeah, thank you, Nico. Yeah, I could have asked for, asked for a better link to that, could I? No, no, well, we've talked about complementary collections, and that's the great thing about uh, the records of Farmer Pass. You, you can find them people now in the 1921 census but then you can look either side and you find 1939 register 1911 but the school records are terrific they, they run from uh, 1870 to 1914 uh, and many of those contain um birth dates um the the name of the father the address uh, when the when the child went to school you might, might get entries in logbooks as well it's an underused collection actually but if you were to go mm. to find my past and type in just type in school go to the all record search type in school you'll you'll see it it's the national uh, schools uh, uh, school admission registers and logbooks collection and it's a really very useful resource i, I think it's uh, tremendous and and the key thing there is uh, that you do to get the dates of birth you don't just get an age you get a date of birth so it's almost like a surrogate a parish register entry and the I entries that... are incredible sorry i'm gonna butt in but i you know the information you can find like this child or these siblings weren't able to attend school today or for the last three months because their father's been out of work like you're not going to get that kind of detail especially about children anywhere else yeah, Absolutely. I think that follows on to a point I was going to say about your favorite sets that complement 1921 census. Oh, man. Newspapers, um, for sure, at the top of the list. Um, I personally like um, things that are a little bit out of the box. So um, I love the newspaper research. I like um, periodicals and the Percy Index. Um, I know one of you wants to talk about trade union directories, so I'll let you guys have that. Um, but it's it, it, there's so many. I think is part of, probably part of the thing is it, is actually that there's a, a, a substantial number of collections from this period through World War. You know, and really, when I say that, I'm what I mean is turn of the century, 1900, all the way through probably the 1939 register. Um, passengers leaving the UK is one of my personal best. I hit it almost every day because that's my area of research. But um, yeah, there's some some really, really incredible uh, materials. Paul, your favorite uh, record sets? Oh, well, I think uh, the, the, the military records, of course, the service records, um, it's, it's very um, easy for people to look for a service record and say, uh, for a First World War service record and say, oh, I've not found it, nothing there, must have been destroyed in bombing. And that, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's an easy answer. And, and of course, in many cases, it's a correct answer as well, because many records were lost, lost in bombing. But don't forget that there were plenty of soldiers who continued to serve, um, either, either continued to serve um, with the regiment that they'd enlisted with, enlisted with or re-enlisted uh, had the war having ended and, uh, and served for an additional period of time. And in those cases, those men's service records won't have been destroyed. They'll have been put with the MOD. And so the question is, you know, having found your 
ancestor, you realize he served overseas in the First World War, you found a metal index card or, or other evidence that he served there, but not found a service record. Can you find him in 1921? Is he there in the 1921 census still serving in the army? And if he is, then the chances are that he has a record with the MOD. So yeah. that's that's the key thing. And the, the trade union records, which you mentioned, it, once you get to this point in history, you know, it was it was illegal to be part of a trade union in the early Victorian era. There was only barely tolerated in the late Victorian era. But at this point in the 20th century, if you were in a job or a trade, you were in a trade union. And it was one of those things. So you'll have a, a really, really almost comprehensive view of different trades, different businesses and people that were working in them. And we've got a, quite a lovely collection of trade union records and cover people. And it's great when someone leaves. My great grandmother was in the railway workers trade union and she left clearly when she got married and didn't need a job anymore. She was, work, you know, become, became a housewife. And uh, so I have the date that she stopped paying her dues. And that if I didn't know that she married, I would, I would then be able to maybe find out why. And there's also other things like uh, perhaps if someone dies, they'll note that in there as well. So there are other bits of detail and it might give you more about uh, what's going on with your ancestors. So um, we've got a few good comments coming through. Um, a good one from Tina, question. It's been suggested that the census was transcribed in India. Was this the case, please? Paul, any Absolute, thoughts? Absolutely it was, yeah. We, we, uh, we work with a transcription house in India and have done for years and um, are very pleased with what they, they turn out. And... TNA National Archives are pleased. The Office for National Statistics is pleased. I went to India with both those organisations to uh, so that they were happy with the, all the standards that you would expect to be in place uh, are in place. That they meet all the necessary uh, criteria and accreditations. Uh, they do. Uh, we wouldn't work with them if they didn't. Um, we've worked with them on many many projects, and we found them to be more accurate than uh, transcription houses in this country. So yeah. It's no, it's no vicious rumor. It's the, it's the truth, and we're very pleased to work with them. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, the, the big question, no matter where someone is, the thing that matters is the accuracy of the transcription, and that's the thing that, um, if you know, there are there are many places and many other family history websites and things that work to lower accuracy rates and things like that. But uh, yeah, it's there are. Um, you know, someone who is qualified and skilled and trained and specially trained to do this, you know, they're hard to find. And if they're in a particular place, then that, that's the important thing, really, I think. So that's a very, very good comment, a very good point. Um, question here from Kaylee. Uh, did some people avoid the census? They haven't found their two times great grandfather and my great grandfather, but found two other members of the household staying at workplaces and with relatives. Jen, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I have lots of thoughts. And I, I, I mean, yeah, of course, some people avoided the census. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm not sure if either of you do. Um, statistically speaking, how many people we think managed to avoid the census. But yes, absolutely. It's possible. It's very hard to know how many things aren't written yeah. down. It's one of those hard numbers. Um, it's, it's hard when, you know, this census is just one night. And it's, it's what happens on that one night. Someone may be, and you'll see uh, people who are staying in a hotel or anything like that. They don't live in the hotel. They just happen to be there on that night. So, you know, there might be your ancestors, your members of this household with workplaces. They may have just been, you know, working through the night or they may have been staying over the shop or something. So lots it's, of reasons. Yeah, it's possible when the enumerator came to collect the form that no one was home, right? He knocked yeah. on the door and found an empty house and, you know, couldn't get that return. So, you know, there's... A, a thousand different circumstances and scenarios that could be the truth. Um, Kaylee, I would suggest that you try a number of those advanced search fields that we've been talking about throughout the hour today. Um, utilize that to, to with every little bit of detail that you know about your family and, and keep digging. You never know, they may pop up and surprise you. Yeah, speaking of um, workplaces and advanced search things, Paul, any thoughts? Can I search by workplace? I can see how to look by employer, but searching by farm will be useful for my farm worker ancestors as they have lots of variations on the employer name. Should be possible. Um, just just uh, play with the search again. Um, use the wildcard. Uh, use the um, optional keywords field as well, typing in those uh, key keywords uh, that, that you're looking for and see what comes up. Um, if you're surprised that you get too few results, then maybe try a different uh, search, different search box. But yeah, there's there's a lot of, we always advise um, less is more really. So so don't fill in too many form, uh, too, too many details to start with. Have Begin with the names, um, maybe if it's a common name, the, the year of birth, and then uh, try some of these other fields, but don't be tempted to fill in multiple fields because that will really uh, reduce the results that come back to you. 
Good point. Yeah. Mixing all those together is the way mix and match all the time. Um, good question here from Matthew, uh, Jen, how reliable are the ages on the 1921 census? My grandfather is with his parents and his age works out exactly with his April 1907 date of birth. It's good in the census where you do get, um, years and months in this one. Um, I have his parents on the 1911 census and the 1939 register, which gives birth dates, but the three records don't seem to match. Well, you know, I think that's a testament to the time we're, period we're talking about, right? As as Paul has already indicated, there's a lot of people who were still illiterate in this era. Um, and the idea of um, knowing your exact birth date wasn't necessarily as important to our ancestors as it is to us today. Um, and things like birth certificates and driver's licenses and passport, app, the, that wasn't necessarily common household items um, for our ancestors. So yeah, it's absolutely possible that um, he got his age wrong in a couple of those records. Um, I would suspect that the 1939 register um, is probably the one I would question the most because that was not something that he filled out himself. Um, I would probably look for other evidence comparing um, the 1911 and the 1921 census and understand that when you search on birth dates, there is always fluctuation um, in any period of history, really. And it's one of the reasons why I find my past always has that plus or minus two years as a, as a standard when you're entering and searching by birth or at any date, actually. Good point. Yeah. yeah. I remember um, on, the, on the literacy front, Jen, remember again, you know, these families with multiple children, my, yep. again, my <laughs> maternal uh, grandmother is, is in this, her, her birth date was always uh, celebrated on the wrong day. The, the, her, her father hadn't recorded it correctly. It was only later on uh, after she died, we realized it was uh, a different date. Um, so they didn't always keep tabs. I mean, he, he was illiterate, as I say, um, and had multiple children and, and probably better things to think about than worrying exactly when they've been born. He was trying to feed them all, for one thing. Um, so, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The information is as good as it is, as was recorded, really, is the answer to that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've got, to, you've got to fight with your own ancestors as well as the official things that are going on. Uh, I know that uh, one of my ancestors, 17 is an unlucky number in Italy, and he was born on the 17th, but he he refuses to accept he was registered as being born on the 18th because he didn't want to be born <laughs> on the 17th. And so uh, that's the thing that I found out just while I was doing the family tree. So, you know, there's lots of things that come through like that, lots of little things. And speaking of strange birth dates that don't quite make sense, Victoria has been looking at school admissions. You see what a nice little Great. interlude. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, she felt rather confused as she found two brothers listed together. But the date of birth given for one is the date of birth of another brother, not on the register. Is the name wrong or is the date of birth wrong? Did a parent muddle the information given to the school mixing up the children, Paul? Or was he a twin? Was the other twin not there? Ah, well, that's possible. Don't know. <laughs> well, it, uh, what a nice conundrum to have, Victoria, isn't it? And thank you. Uh, I recognise you, Victoria. You're one of our regular uh, contributors and uh, always always nice to see your comments. Um, yeah, I don't... Uh, Again, it's the information you can only go by what's been written down there, can't you? So, so take it, record it, note it, um, and, and store it, put it to one side. Um, but at least you have those those dates there, um, and some more evidence, another piece of the jigsaw. And it's, it's all about context, right? Um, we use this example a lot in the United States because um, uh, death certificates in particular are notoriously um, bad, right? They notoriously have the wrong information because the person reporting the death might be two generations away from the person who actually died. So put it into context, right? Who was giving the information? Who was actually documenting it? Was it um, and likely with school records, it was some member of staff or a clerk at the school or the headmistress or headmaster at the school. Maybe they misheard. Maybe they got the information wrong. Maybe they just confused the two brothers. Um, just about any situation, again, would be possible. I, a question here from Kathy uh, for you, Paul. Mate, where are all the comments on the census that she's heard discussed on news programs? I've seen a few coming through a lot, but yeah, where can she find them? Well, um, We've published we've published uh, a video, I think, haven't we, giving details of census fines and when we were conserving the, the census prior to it being scanned, our, our team of uh, uh, checkers, conservers, conservators, technicians uh, were looking for things like this. They were looking for comments. They were looking for interesting fines that were in the boxes along with the census. We found all sorts of things. You know, tram tickets pencil stubs all sorts of things a few dead insects as well dead insects mm -hmm. from the 1920s not from the nine not from the 2020s um so 
when they found that, they, they noted it down in, in a fines book. And then we um, went back to those comments uh, when, when we were doing the, the pre uh, the publicity for the 1921 census. So so they're there, but they're on different records. Um, I'm not sure, maybe maybe you know, Mika or Jen, um, if we have published links to those particular pages. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the answer to that. I would say um, the blog would be, the Find My Past blog would be one of the places where we'll highlight those stories and we'll certainly highlight them over the course of the next several months. Um, so I don't know that we've we've done them all that have hit the media at this point. We certainly have a number of stories to tell. And I don't know that we'll do links to images. We'll certainly show the image though. Um, uh, but the blog would be, the Find My Past blog would be the first place I would check for some of those interesting finds. Yeah. Um... Uh, Rosemary has made a comment, an observation. She found loads of dates of birth wrong in school admission records. She's concluded parents made their children look older in order to get them out of the house. And I think, yeah, <laughs> and all the small children I mean, probably agree with that. Yeah. A couple of parents on this call. I think we <laughs> nod our heads and go, yeah, yeah okay, that the makes sense. For ages, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get them off the laptops. <laughs> Uh, that's good. And, and a good comment from Donna as well, talking about how um, that she's having fun. She's enjoying the session. You get used to doing research on your own. Hearing others discussing it is helpful in confirming what you're doing right, helping where you might not be. So the, uh, the this question and answer session is monthly, but every week, every Friday, we have a good session where one of us will be in front of the camera and talking about our finds or things we're, we're intrigued by and the new records have been released. And it's where everyone can talk about their questions, their queries, their big discoveries. It's a great thing and a great place. And even outside of that, during the week itself, there are other discussions and chats about different things going on. This is our Find My Pass From Home thing. And I said, you're in the room with three hosts for the price of one. You pay for the whole seat, but you only need the edge in this presentation. And it's a sort of thing that uh, definitely take advantage it doesn't cost you anything. Just get to our Facebook page and hopefully it can really help you get further. So, it's And good to hear don't forget to go out. back and look at previous sessions too. They're all on our Facebook and YouTube channels. So um, you can watch endless hours of us rambling about family history. <laughs> Should you choose to. <laughs> Should you choose to. <laughs> yes. If, if you have any small children, maybe that will put them to sleep if you, uh, you want to go for some of my earlier ones. I can actually attest to that. That's happened at my house. <laughs> Uh, question from Ivy. I found my granddad and his family in 1921 census. His father had lovely handwriting. When trying to record the source of the info my family tree, I can't find the reference to the household schedule. Where can I find that? Any thoughts on that, anyone? Um, it's certainly in the transcription. Um, mm. It's also on the, if you've purchased the image, it's in the extra materials on the front, the image of the cover of the book um, mm -hmm. itself. So there's a, a reference number um, on the cover of the book. So look at those extra materials. Uh, make sure you get all of those images that are attached to your household return and note uh, your citation from those, um, those uh, pieces of information. That's a question that I've heard a lot. I haven't seen it come up here today, but uh, I've, I've definitely heard it. So let's answer that one as well for those who might. Um, oh, we've got a thing from Kate saying thank you. She's enjoying exploring 1921 and thank you for all the hard work, which is always lovely to hear. Um, but one of the, the questions uh, that keeps coming up is where do I find the address? I've got the census. I've got the image of my household and I can't see the address. Paul, where would I go to find that address if I'm just looking at that image of the household? It's on, it's on the other side of the form, isn't it? It's un unlike the uh, 1911 census where it was written in the, in the same box in that bottom right-hand corner. Um, it's on the other side. So you need to go to the extra materials uh, button, press that, and, and look at the front of the document. And that's where the address is. And all of those extra materials, they're all part of the, the, the image that you purchase, isn't it? That's right. That's Absolutely, right. yeah. You get, the, um, you get that, you get the cover of the book, you get the plan of division, uh, uh, details and you get the map as well so a lot of information there great stuff a uh, good question from Helen uh, I think this has got Jen's name all over it I really struggle to find anything from the newspapers and pasture lists as I family I know travel to Canada but then I cannot find them where they went after they arrived what documents will I need to look for once I have the arrival in Canada uh, well, it kind of depends on where in Canada. It's a relatively large country, so and and the time frame that we're talking about, Helen. Um, but generally speaking, um, Canada um, Canadian materials are represented on a number of different genealogy websites. Um, Find My Past has several collections. 
Um, but I would specifically refer, refer you to the province in question. Um, if you know where in general they landed, then go to that province, find their local genealogical society. Every single province has a wonderful genealogical society that actually has a full list of references on their websites, um, including the commercial sites. Um, so really lean on the family history organizations across Canada for additional information about where to research and what to look for. Um, but you'll find city directories, you'll find um, voter registration, you'll find Canadian censuses uh, and land and property records, just like you would in any other major English speaking country. That's a good point. Yeah, it's a big thing. And I think I know as we're getting slowly towards the end, we've got time for a few more questions, but a good thing from Pauline, uh, she's talking about the, the virtual roadshow that we're doing. And so whichever one you, you've signed up to visit, or if there are ones that you're interested in going to, you'll hear one of us talking about the census. So you'll get a condensed hour of uh, all of the things you need to know from uh, all of this and the chance to ask more questions yourself. Uh, but she wants to know how she can access any of the uh, programs after the session because she said there was one last Saturday which was the one at the National Archives and she didn't know until afterwards so can she watch it again yeah, Nico, why uh, don't you answer this yeah, actually yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, been... yes. I, I'm, I've enjoyed having a back seat to this it's been great fun like <laughs> a lazy interviewer isn't he Jen I'm going to get yeah, yeah. Next time. He's, he's got all the questions now from here on out <laughs> no, <I'm fine. laughs> um, but uh, Yes, if most of these sessions are being recorded and they'll be available uh, in a members area or somewhere like that of these different societies so that those members can take advantage. If you're not a member of your local family history society uh, and don't just think about the ones that you uh, live near, think about the ones where your ancestors are from. So there are plenty of places. If you're looking at 1921 England and Wales census, there's going to be a local society that you should probably be talking to or know lots of things. And they're probably on our census tour. Uh, have a word with them, find out. A lot of these said will be in their members' areas afterwards if you can't go and see them. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to find a time that agrees with you as well. So that'll be a one. Um, and a comment from Vicky Lee. Um, uh, when are you going to start ripping ancestry addicted people off with pay-per-view documents? That's the thing that came up. Paul, any yeah, thoughts? I put that, yeah, I put, posted that because I, um, I just take exception to that, really. It's... Um, we're not ripping people off, and I, and I'm sorry that you feel that way, Vicky. Um, I did address this at, at the start of the um, talk this afternoon, but but maybe you weren't there for that. Um, but it, but the thing is, it costs Five Past a lot of money to to bring to market. Um, National Archives couldn't do it. We we did it. We won it. Um, but we have to recoup the investment by by charging people to to view those images, and we want to make it available to everybody. So that's why it's not in a sub, but. Uh, but for now, it's a choice you have. You can take it or leave it. Um, you can pay 250 to view the transcription, um, but, but for that matter, you don't need to pay for the transcription. You can just view the image. Uh, so that's that's the reason we are charging for this separately. It was such a big a big thing to go to to do and to undertake. It's uh, the biggest project that uh, the National Archives have ever brought. To to, to, to bear and uh, yeah it's so many hundreds of people working on it and so many records and images and when you when you find that one with your relative finding all kinds of great stuff I, I, I get really excited. I said I've not had much time to dig too much into 90s from the census but seeing my great grandparents and seeing they were working at the same school just before they married and thinking that must be where they met that that that's priceless it's so amazing to just have that wonderful feeling of knowing that so yeah it's uh, been a big project but there are some really exciting finds in there and uh, there are certainly some some more lurking as well. Um, as we get to uh, towards the end, uh, let's see if we can uh, pull out a few other questions. I'm just going to pop this up really quick. Audrey, thank you for this. Um, just going back to our conversation about the session on Saturday. It was recorded. Mm -hmm. It is free. They aren't on the website or YouTube channel yet, but they will be soon. So for those of you looking specifically for that National Archive session, um, keep wa watch this space. We'll, we'll, everybody will let you know when that becomes available. Great stuff. Good stuff. Um, and a question from Akasha. Can you just look at the image without buying it first? Uh, the answer is no. Um, you have to, uh, you, you can run the searches so you can see what's going to be appearing on the image um, because you'll you'll run a search for, for a person and, and see the result come up. Um, and then you can also see if you hover over the transcription icon, uh, other, other household names uh, in that same return. But you won't see the image until you click on the, the image icon. Then you have to pay for that. That's fair, fair point. That's the one. Uh, and uh, a couple of other uh, questions and comments. Um, 
I'm just uh, taking a note. A couple of people have made a note about the price. Robert has made a good point that it's, it's much less expensive than having to fly to England from Canada. So that's uh, uh, one thing uh, to, to bear in mind. I'm not sure how much it costs for a flight at the moment, but that's a, a, a lot of census records. <laughs> um, and one comment, I think um, you might have some thoughts, and maybe you as well, Jen, about um, volunteer transcribers could have transcribed the census. And that she, uh, she's a Janice is a transcriber for her local society. There are reasons why that couldn't happen, aren't there? Paul? Oh, uh, well, yes. Uh, I was, did you see me shaking my head there? I um, did, yeah. I mean, I was doing the same <laughs> thing. But yeah. um, uh, we we weren't, weren't permitted to, to do it, for one thing. Um, it's a, it was a, still a, an open document when we were transcribing this. It was a highly secure project. Um, and in fact, it was transcribed overseas, as, as you know. Um, but the people overseas only accessed the images from our servers. And, and then they didn't see the entire image. So they would only have seen... One person would have seen half the image, another person would have seen the other half. So it was a very, and then the whole thing was, um, it, it was encrypted and was only decrypted um, 50 days before we uh, we launched. So we had to then put everything back together again. So it was a, it was a very secure project. Um, we had 350 people at one stage working on it on the on the transcription side of things, and we had a deadline um, by which we needed to publish it. So you just cannot do that with with volunteers, which is why we did it commercially. And, and it's, it, I mean, go on, Jen. Oh, I was just going to add. You know, we have some really fantastic um, volunteers that do other types of transcription and other types of records correction for us. And Absolutely. just just a shout out to those people because they do a considerable amount of work and they um, are very passionate, they're very dedicated and we appreciate them so very much. Um, but to Paul's point, it, the security restrictions around this project were just too limiting. There's just no way we could do that with volunteers. Yeah, and so it's incredible that it all happened over COVID as well. Just, yeah. just doing that will go on, it's a really big yeah. thing. Um, so uh, as as we round off, I said there's a lots and lots of questions and comments still there. Um, so you will be able to find us on the Find My Past virtual tour, which uh, uh, Ellie has very helpfully in the comments posted a link to all of the different dates and venues that are there. If you can find that blog post with everything in, and uh, I recommend you come and see us because we're going to be able to you know give you the chance to ask some more questions, and of course we'll give you as much information as you can handle. It's going to be a big thing, and. Uh, and then we've got Jen as well on Friday, who's going to be That's doing right. a regular Farmer Pass Fridays. Jen, what's happening on that Friday? Um, Friday, I'm really excited, actually, because we want to know your stories. We want to hear about your projects um, and your discoveries um, through the 1921 census. It's all about you this Friday. So if you have found something amazing or even something that has blown a brick wall or even a disappointing one, right? Um, maybe something you didn't quite learn. We want to hear about your 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 stories. So send us an email at discoveries at findmypast.com um, with your particular story. We would love to know more, and we will be talking all about that on Friday right here on Facebook and YouTube. So feel free to leave comments um, on our page as well when we post that event. I'm really excited about that chat. Um, also, just one last thing, Nico, before I hand you the microphone back. There was another comment about where can I send transcription errors. I'm just going to put that on the screen one more time. If you find a transcription error using the image, um, please send that error to transcript support at findmypass.com so that we can put that in the queue. Yeah, and there's one question. I know that this came through just just before the bell, so I want to get it out there just so that it, you've had a fair go. Uh, question from Sam, Paul. Uh, why was it a secure project? What are the reasons for it compared to, say, the 1939 register, which was published 18 years later? Have you got an answer for Sam? Yes, uh, the, the census, 1921 census is governed by the Census Act, uh, which means that it can't be opened for 100 years. The 1939 register was not a census, uh, and so it wasn't governed by that same uh, Act of Parliament, So, which means, uh, which is the reason we were able to open it and publish it a lot earlier. But 1921 census was still an open document uh, up until uh, the 1st of January this year. Okay. There we go. So I hope we've brought you to your census today. Uh, oh. through the, you knew it was coming. I did, All of but you I was just hoping that, that you were just not. <laughs> no, never. Um, there we go. It's out there. We've done it. 
Uh, but uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming and asking your questions. And uh, it's been you know, really helpful uh, for us as well to, to hear that the questions people have been asking, because we'll make sure um, that all of these are going to be included and covered when we do our presentations as well. We've got a comment from Gillian. Thank you, Miko, Jen and Paul from Happy User. Uh, great job with the 1921 census on all fronts. Lovely. Lots of people saying thank you as well. Um, we're really hopeful to speak to you soon, whether that's on the road or, uh, again, you'll see Jen on Friday. And uh, you'll see definitely myself and Paul at other Pharma Pass sessions. So thank you very much for joining us. And we hope to see you very soon indeed. And we can't wait to find out what you discover in the 1921 census. Take care. See you later on. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.